He said you'd come. Now let's hope that you're not too late. We know each other. He's a friend from work. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 57 of the Wulong Talks podcast. My name is Jason. I'm the host of the show, as you know. And uh, this week, we're going to be doing a very special podcast for the passing of somebody who was uh, a legend and a warrior for the geek culture. And that, of course, is Stan Lee. Um, We're joined by a couple of guests today as well who are going to help us kind of go through Stan's legacy and, and talk about what the, the work that he did means to us. Um, but first of all, let me um, introduce to you the, the rest of the crew. So we've got the Rustin Kid, Rich Kid in the house, as always. What's up, yeah. Rich? Yeah, what's happening, people? Good to be back. It's been a little while. Yeah, indeed, man, indeed. And we'll tell you all about our adventures on another pod. But um, first of all, uh, oh, sorry. Well, not first of all, but welcoming back the Mank Geek Big A. Big A, say what's up? What's up? And we've also got another special guest with us. You heard him on the podcast before a couple of times by now. You know that he's a good friend of ours. He's a very talented script writer and filmmaker. Um, and he's just a super cool dude as well. Um, and his name is Jed Shepard. Jed, what's up, man? Welcome back. Yeah, cheers, guys. Glad to be back. Yeah, you know, it's one of my favorite pop culture podcasts, so... Um, and it literally is one of the one of the few podcasts I listen to every week without well when it comes out every week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, that's that's not been so regular that. these days, has it? Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> news from you guys, like because um, I miss cause so much information nowadays. But um, you guys distill it down to what I actually need to know about what's going on in like comics and like comic book movies and stuff. And so um, yeah, you provide a good service. So I'm glad to give some back. Oh, um, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate that, dude. Thanks very much, man. Um, we know that Salt is going great guns online at the moment. Yeah, um, yeah and it looks like it's it's doing fantastically well. So congratulations with that, man. Yeah, cheers. And everyone's calling for a feature, so that's kind of what's going to happen. But um, can't reveal too much about that. But yeah, this mm. is all going to plan. So um, yeah, hopefully all the people that have seen it um, have uh, enjoyed it and want to see a 90-minute version and uh, those that don't, then, oh, well, you're going to see a 90-minute version. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's, that's that's for a future podcast, maybe. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. But, um, yeah, listeners, I mean, as, as you probably know by now, um, you know, earlier this week uh, we lost Stan Lee, the – uh, co-founder, I guess, of of Marvel Comics. Um, you know the the guy who created so many of uh, and co-created so many of the heroes that that we love and grew up with as kids, and have gone on to become um, you know pop culture icons. And and Lee himself as was was somebody who who ultimately became um, so hugely important to. Uh, to the culture that we love, really. Um, you know, his work has influenced just about everyone and everything. Um, I saw earlier this week that somebody referred to, to Stan Lee as the Quincy Jones of, of comic books. Um, and mm. I thought that was such an apt, um, you know, kind of way of, of, of putting it and de- of describing him, really, because, you know, his fingerprints are, are everywhere today in the comic book world. Um, whatever kind of comic books you like to read, you know, you will find um, Stan Lee's imprint in there somewhere. So, yeah, you know, he's he, he truly was a, an incredible creator. Um, so, as I said, with this episode, we're, we're just going to kind of, you know, give you some of our thoughts and how we're feeling about the, the news. Um, I know some people are really devastated. Um, some of us are, are perhaps more reflective and and some of us are more celebratory. So we'll give you our kind of take on on how we think and, and feel about 
um, Stan Lee and, and what he came to represent and and um, also share some personal anecdotes with you as well about the kind of experiences we had with his work and, and what it means to us. So um, first off, guys, I guess, I guess we start off by asking the obvious question, really. But, um, you know, the, the name Stan Lee became kind of synonymous with a certain quality and, you know, he, his name almost became a brand in and of itself. Um, but the question I wanted to ask you guys is when did you first hear the name Stan Lee? Um, you know, as in when did you first kind of become aware of, of who he actually was? Um, and uh, Rich Kid, you can go first as I know you're, um, well, you're our resident comic book guru. So, yeah, man, take the first swing. Yeah, I, I remember obviously just seeing his name, just seeing his name everywhere. Um, so, like, you know, you'd, you'd pick up a comic book and it would be like Stan Lee Presents. Um, and where, where it was one of those things where when I started reading comic books in the 80s, like I was still reading stuff from the 60s and the 70s. Mm. And, uh, and, and his voice, I mean, his voice is, was always heard throughout the comic books in the 80s as well. But it was, it was really something different when you, when you were reading it, like during that period when he first started. So I just remember seeing his name and just going like, oh, and, that, and then my uncle telling me that, yeah, Stan Lee's the guy, you know who does the writing and then you know Kirby's the guy who does the art and they, they, and he told me the story like them being best friends and I'd be like wow like best friends but then that's when I first heard Stan Lee's name and then I put the first time I put face to name was basically when I started watching like the old school cartoons like I'd watch I think Spider-Man and his amazing friends mm. and like you'd hear then, then you'd hear the voice of Stan Lee like hey hey true believers in today's episode and you know and all that stuff and then you would just see like little caricatures of him in a Marvel comic book, or you'd see him do like a cameo in a comic book. So, so essentially, like give or take, when I first started reading comics, that's when I first heard the name, um, and like, and I was just, I just felt that he was something special. And then when I was told that he, you know, you know what he'd managed to do, I was just like, Jesus, like this guy's a god. So yeah, yeah, for sure, man, for sure. Um... Alf, how about you, man? When was the first time you heard the name Stan Lee? The first time was kind of like my sister had seen Mole Rats, and he has a cameo in that movie. And um, I'd been getting comics for a short while at that point. And she had mentioned him, not by name, because she didn't know his, his name properly, but she had said to me that, oh, that Marvel guy, that guy who does the comic books is in, is in Mole Rats. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> You know what I mean? And then she said again, like the comics, like the guy, the Marvel Comics guy, he's he's in that movie. He makes an appearance. You know, you know the one. And she described him as like, nah, I don't know what you're talking about and that. And then I can't remember when, but some point afterwards, I kind of became like familiar with his face and how he looked like and all that kind of business. And um, and yeah, and then I just started as the years went by, I started to realize kind of like how much he was involved in and how many like TV shows and stuff were based on things he was involved with or created and stuff like that. And then you just realize it's a, it's a whole heap of stuff, like loads and loads of stuff. So, mm. so the first time kind of hearing about him rather than his actual name, um, maybe I was like, wait, t- 10, 11, maybe, mm. maybe around age. Um, but putting a face to it was, was a little bit later. Mm. Mm. And Jed, how about you? My, I think mine's gonna gonna sound like I'm nuts or something, because um, obviously, like when I was a kid in like primary school, I mean, comics were coming back and forth, and like my parents were buying me comics, but probably not the kind of comics. They're probably like stuff like the Beano and the Dandy and all that crap now. But um, and then a, and then a couple of times, some Marvel comics like came my way when I was maybe like eight or nine, and I was like, I was kind of getting into them, but nothing. I think they were probably like DC or. Um, and then maybe around the age of like 10, 9, 10, I got my first proper comic that I actually remember. And it was a, a copy of the Fantastic Four. And um, from that day until now, like Fantastic Four have been the, the comic that I, I love the most and ones I, I know more about. And I will, on my, till my dying day, say that they are the greatest Stanley creation like ever. They're the greatest comic mm-hmm. book there is. Um, and in the Fantastic Four, especially in that first run, uh, when it was him and Kirby, like the first like hundred issues or so, 
He used to put oh, first oh, 101, 101 issues. Yeah, something like that. He <laughs> himself and Kirby in those issues. Um, but I like I, obviously he did like the letters page and things like that. But I think when I properly, properly, properly knew who he was was when in secondary school when this uh, and I went to you guys know I went to Salesian College Secondary School in South London. And uh, I think I told a story on the last podcast I was on, but this guy used to like steal comics to order for us. <laughs> <laughs> and he used to go to Avalon Comics. And this is guy, I, I'm going to call him out, his name is Marlon. And, uh, and he used to sell comics, one pound for any comic. Doesn't matter if they're old comics, new comics, annuals, it was just one pound a comic. And I would give him a shopping list, right? I'd give me fan, get me Fantastic Four number. 50 fantastic four number 87 get me issue 100 one pound each one pound one pound each and i was like can you get me fantastic four issue 48 uh, which is when the when galactus like first appears and i was like oh, he's gonna charge me a fortune for this he got it for me it was like uh, on card card on the wall in the shop in avalon comics and he got it for me and i paid him one pound and now it's worth a, like a fair fortune the first appearance of Galactus. But yeah, around that time, um, he Stanley used to put himself on the cover of the comics as well, like little characters, him and Kirby commenting on what's in the issue. And you used to see a little kind of like figure of him saying, um, oh, the fans are going to love this. Um, uh, I made Doctor Who part of, uh, not Doctor Who, <laughs> I made Doctor Doom part of the Fantastic Four. That'd be great if Doctor Who was in Fantastic Four. But mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's an issue where he's, um, Stanley's on the cover saying the fans got to go wild for Doctor Doom being in Fantastic Four and Mr. Fantastic's the bad guy. I just thought, who is this guy? Like breaking the fourth wall. I wasn't saying it in these times when I was a kid. Breaking the fourth wall um, and kind of narrating what's going to kind of happen in the comic. You know, this guy's powerful. But again, I, di- I didn't put two and two together. I didn't kind of realize that someone could create like a world. It, it just didn't sink in that someone, like one person or a couple of people, could create a whole universe full of like basically everything that I like. Um, and I think it wasn't until psh, way later, maybe it was actually more rats as, as, as well, where I realized, oh shit, this guy, this is the guy that kind of has created everything I love. And put a name to her face because I don't think he'd done too many cameos before more rats. Maybe maybe he was in a couple or I saw him in some TV shows. But yeah, I think it was more rats when I first kind of realized what he looked like and how he sounded. Um but yeah but also oh yeah, the weird part of the story is um I do you remember that book that kid's book called Flat Stanley? Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah about, about the the guy of the kid who was so flat he could he could go in an envelope he could send him because his name was Stanley, I always like, I don't know why, but in my mind, I was like, oh, Stan Lee, like, he, you can put him in an envelope and send him places. <laughs> <laughs> Even to this day, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, Stan Lee, he was, he was like, if I, if, I, if I start to like, kind of like, my mind, let my mind wander, I still think of him as a guy you could put in an envelope and send. Don't know <laughs> but yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, it, it seems kind of like we all kind of stumbled across Stan Lee in that way. I mean, for, for me personally, um, it I guess I first kind of became aware of, of who he was around sort of 1991. Um, this was when, um, you know, like you, Jed, I'd, uh, my first sort of experience with comic books um, in the early years was, you know, the Beano and the Dandy. Um, you know, my parents used to buy me those. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of after that period, around sort of 91, um, was when I went to Grenada and I first met my granddad, um, the, the one and only time I met him uh, in life. Um, and he was a, a, an avid comic book collector. It, it, it turned out that um, he had befriended um, some of the U.S. military troops who had been based in in Grenada during um, the uprising in the eighties, um, and one of the troops was was an avid comic book collector and kind of had got him into it, um, and then so he started to get into it because he liked kind of all of the the artwork and the images and things like that. So he collected a lot of DC stuff, but he also collected um, quite a bit of Marvel. Um, and as a gift to me when I was leaving him, he gave me a, a set of comic books that were um, Conan, uh, Conan the Barbarian, um, oh. Spider-Man, um, and I think it was a Fantastic Four as well. 
Um, and and Luke Cage. Yeah, he gave me Luke Cage as well. Um, that I could, and he said, you know, take them and and, and keep them and read them when when you get back to England. Um, and I remember reading the the, the story and realizing now nowadays, I you know I, I know better and realizing, but the book he'd actually given me, the Spider Man book, was Spider Man No More. Um, mm. the the famous issue where Spider Man, um, you know, quits being Spidey basically. Mm -hmm. And um, towards the end of that, there was this this thing which was like um, a letters page almost, um, where you could you know people could write in and, and give their opinions on the stories and, and things like that, and he would respond. And there was this um, page where you know people would write in with with their questions about the story or or the previous issue. Um, and there was this, you know, blurb from Stan Lee explaining why he'd made the decisions that he did and, and things like that. And there was something about the tone in which he wrote those letters that seemed really cheery and genuine and passionate. Mm. Um, and I remember him signing it Stan Lee at the end and thinking, bloody hell, like, who's this Stan Lee guy? Like, he, he sounds like such a nice guy. Yeah. And then I think the first time I actually realised who he was was when I uh, again um, maybe a couple of years after that was when I started watching reruns of the old Incredible Hulk series, um, the live action TV series with Bill Bixby and, and Lou Ferrino, um, and I remember watching the trials of the Incredible Hulk, um, mm -hmm. and I was was watching this with uh, a friend of mine, and it was a scene where he's you know in the courtroom and he's being pressured. Uh, this is Doctor Banner. He's being pressured by um, the prosecuting lawyer, who you know is, is saying you d you did this, Banner. You did this, and and is shouting at him, and he's doing his whole Hulk out thing. Um, and you get this shot of this kind of grey haired guy with glasses sitting in the front row in the witness box, <laughs> looking very kind of like disgusted by all of the, the proceedings that are going on around him. And my friend turned to me and said, that's Stan Lee. And then like a light bulb went off in my head and I was like, what, Stan Lee? You mean the guy who wrote like Spider-Man? And so he said, yeah, yeah. And then ever since then, it was like I always kind of, you know, looked out for, for him in, in everything that I saw because he, as said, he just kind of looked exactly kind of how I imagined him to look based on, on the words he used. And yeah. um, he just had this kind of, even as said in, in this, you know, this small cameo appearance that he makes, you can see that, you know, as much as he's trying to react within the, the, the scene and, you know, kind of show fear and, and, and as discuss as said, there's so much excitement in his eyes. That like, oh my God, I'm doing a live action Incredible Hulk. You know, this is one of my creations and I'm here and I'm sitting on set. And, you know, he, he can't hide his enthusiasm for it. Yeah, yeah. And it's so infectious as well. And, and I just was like, wow, this guy, like, he really loves what he does, man. And, and, and you know, he really, really, you, you kind of deeply feel the, the, the passion that he feels. And um, you also feel, you know, the, the, the honesty in his work and, and the generosity of, of the man himself as well, which is, you know, just incredible. So, so yeah, for me, that was kind of the first experience I, I kind of had at the first time I'd, I'd really kind of heard the name Spike, uh, Spike, I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing the same thing the newspaper did in Australia. Sorry, yeah. Spike, you're, you're still with us. This is the first time I heard Stanley. Um, so yeah, you know, that, that was probably my first, um, sort of awareness of him and, and my experience of him really. Um, but I mean, he's looking back at it, he's had such an incredible journey to kind of get to, to where he's got to, mm. um, you know, he came from pretty humble beginnings. It's, it's fair to say, I mean, he, he, um, for those of you that don't know, he, he was born, um, Stanley Martin Leiber. Um, uh, this was on December the 28th, 1922 in Manhattan, New York, New York City. Um, his parents were Romanian Jewish immigrants. Um, and he basically lived through that, that spent that part of that early part of his life through the great depression. And so he would have seen, you know, a lot of poverty and, and, and strife during that, that period. Cause the great depression was, an, um, an absolutely terrible time, um, in American history, really. Um, so, you know, it wouldn't have been easy for him um, in those early stages in his life. Apparently, he, he trained as a dress cutter 
um, uh, sorry, no, his father tra had trained as a dress cutter, not him. Um, but he, as a child, was was said to be influenced a lot by um, the work of Errol Flynn, and um, you know, particularly because Errol Flynn, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a, a very famous actor from sort of the golden age of Hollywood. Um, he was known for you know kind of playing um, heroic characters, in particular Robin Hood. Mm. Um, so a lot of the you know the the kind of things that you're used to seeing in in Robin Hood adaptations from from movies and things like that come from from the Errol Flynn movies. Um, so a lot of that seems to kind of have, have shaped, you know, his um, his early love of, of heroes and, and telling the stories of heroes and and sort of that that modern mythology. Um, but as said, you know, he and his family had a, a very tough start to, to life in uh, in America. It was very very difficult for him. Um, he always kind of dreamed of, of writing the the great American novel as well, um, which. Uh, I guess in a way, I mean, we'll get to this later, but we can argue that he already has done that uh, tenfold really in yeah. his work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, he, he was a, a really kind of passionate writer from a, a very early age. Um, he became an assistant at um, a company called Timely Comics in 1933. Uh, Timely Comics was a, a division of Pulp Magazine. Um, and he was put in charge there or he was employed there to, to kind of do sort of day-to-day -day duties. He would kind of refill the artist's pens and, and things like that and make sure the ink wells were, were filled through and, and, and all of that, you know. Um, he started to make his, his comic book debut very early on, becoming a, a text filler for Captain America. Um, in one of the early kind of issues, I think the first issue he worked on was Captain America Comics number three, um, which is in 1941. Um, and he wrote under the Swiden in uh, Stan Lee. So that's where the name kind of Stan Lee is, is, is first um, seen, really. Wasn't it because he, was, um, he didn't want to use his real name because he thought people would um, be prejudiced against him for Jewish. writing comics? No, for writing Yes, comics. that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, have a pen mm. name. So when he wrote, wrote the great American novel, he could use his real name and, and yeah. people like, oh, but that's the guy that writes comics. Exactly. Yeah, exactly that. So, um, yeah, he did adopt this this uh, pen name um, so that he didn't have to use his real name so that it wouldn't prejudice people against him. And I think, um, Rich, you're probably right as well. I suspect, you know, I mean, bearing in mind this is the early 1940s, mm. um, you know, uh, America hadn't entered World War Two at this point. So, um, you know, the the attitude towards people of Jewish heritage at that point, you know, might not have been as open-minded as, uh, as it is today. So mm. yeah, you know, there's, there's probably every likelihood that, that he may have done it for that reason as well. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, to see kind of how he, he, he started out because it's a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of these great kind of writers um, that you look at throughout history and throughout human culture, you know, they often kind of start out at a very, very basic and, and humble beginnings, as, as said, you know, there, there's very little um, in the way of privilege that, that offers itself up to them early on. They often have to struggle in order to get um, some kind of foothold into, you know, the the art form that they love, or or to start uh, doing the work that they want to do. So, mm. so you know, it, it's fascinating to see how that kind of informed um, what he did. And with term in terms of you know the the kind of char the characters that he created, or, or the characters that that he certainly pushed forward, um, you know, you can see that all of them are characters who are people with real world problems um you know that and that's something that is the real feature of all of the work that he did um particularly with kind of the the golden age of, of sort of marvel character uh, comic characters as well um you know one of my favorites is is spider-man for for reasons I'll, I'll get into but um for the rest of you guys i mean for um alvin do you have like a, a specific favorite character from um from Stanley's many, many, you know, characters that he created. Um, well, from when I was a kid, uh, the first kind of thing that I was exposed to that I didn't know even was a comic book at the time because I was like five or whatever uh, was, as you mentioned, The Incredible Hulk. I know you mentioned one of the specials, 
uh, being trial of the Incredible Hulk. But that was I used to love like running around and pretending to be Hulk. Like I wanted like ripped ripped jeans. You know what I mean? <laughs> like and my mum did do that for me once as well because I fucking just loved Hulk so much. So that that was an early one. Uh, and then later finding out uh, through comics that it was like Marvel related and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was just kind of much more like, oh, so I've been into this shit before I even knew this, what this shit really was. Um, but but yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'm just gonna have to say Hulk because that was the first character of his that I'd come across, although it was in TV form uh, and not in comic book form. But but yeah, I'd, I'd have to say Hulk. Mm, mm, no doubt, no doubt. Um, yeah, Hulk was was definitely one of those characters that you really kind of um, were drawn to because of. The, the the parallels between you know him and this monster that kind of rages within him and it, and it was a really kind of powerful um idea for for showing how humanity can be so um conflicted and how we can have you know two sides to our character in a way that kind of dr jekyll and mr hyde um also does you know um but hulk did it in such a, a vivid way and in a way that kids could really kind of access and, and understand as well um, so yeah, Hulk is a good shout, man. Um, Jed, how about you, dude? I mean, I know you mentioned the Fantastic Four before. You want to stick with those? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Fantastic Four, and I mean, because that was basically, I think it's his masterpiece. There's, there's so many characters that spawned off from it. Obviously, uh, Galactus and Silver Surfer, um, and a whole host of it. the Inhumans came from like Fantastic Four. But the actual Fantastic Four themselves, I think, having a family who are as flawed as a normal family is you've got like the, the two leads who are basically just a bickering couple, like, like any like relationship you have a real world couple who argue just constantly. There's jealousy. Like Mr. Fantastic is always jealous of like Sue's like any time a guy's around, you just he gets a little bit suspicious, even though why, why would she cheat? Like he's Mr. Fantastic. <laughs> it's probably like stretched for a mile. Mm. Uh, and then you've got, um, and then you've got uh, Human Torch, who is also a dick. He's a, he is like a he's a dick, and like he gets a bit more mature as time goes on. But he's essentially like a teen a teenage guy who has the ability to fly and just to flame on when he wants. Um, and he uses, especially in his early ones, he uses his powers almost for not to help the world, but to help himself get girls, get like fast cars and stuff. And then you've got who I think someone who's a little bit of a parallel for Hulk. You've got someone who's who's uh, the thing who's like a big monster that people are scared of. But like the thing is, like deep inside, he's just like a innocent boy. He he just kind of wants to find love. But like the fact is, he can't because he is a grotesque monster. And that's why when he finally like meets uh, a blind girl who um, who doesn't care what he looks like, she cares about the person he who he is is so beautiful and and this is a kid's comic and you're learning these lessons at a young age you like, oh okay it's a and it, it's this thing that kind of makes puts it into into perspective like yeah it doesn't matter what they look like on the, on the outside because their actions actually matter and um yeah i mean i guess only done it in a way where they kind of amplify the, the situation where it's a blind girl and maybe that kind of also was a kind of thing about love is blind and etc um i just think there's so many lessons you can learn from from, from the fantastic four and that's why it's an absolute crime that they haven't done a film justice yet they haven't made a fantastic film fantastic four film properly yet and i think it's really easy to do you, like it just they've got the wrong people involved and um it, all you have to do is make it about family there's, like the Incredibles can do it, Incredibles Two can do it. Why can't there be a Fantastic Four movie? Get Brad Bird to direct it. Boom. Um, so yeah, Fantastic Four. Just because I think it's the the one Marvel uh, long running Marvel creation that actually feels real to me. Even though they've got superpowers, it doesn't even matter. That they, they feel like a real family to me. Mm, mm. Um, Rich Kid, how about you, man? Hey, sorry, what's the question again? <laughs> sorry, my bad, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So literally, you've just spent the last ten minutes not listening to a word anybody no, no. said. I've been listening. Okay. I've been like, I've been like, oh, it's fucking beautiful, man. Like, I've got tears in my eyes. But what's the question again? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what was your your favorite of um, Stanley's creations of the of the characters that he created? Um, it was it, it was weird because like. 
the thing is, when I like, I, I didn't just comics weren't just given to me like given to me sporadically. The thing is, it's like I was given comics like, okay, cool, read this and read this, and I would go to like for um, they are because I lived down, I lived in Battersea. Jed and Jed mentioned um, Avalon Comics, yeah. so I used to go to I used to go to Avalon Comics when it when it first opened. So it was one of those things where, as a kid, you're like you're super impressionable. So obviously, like comic books come out on particular weeks that you know whatever. So I one week I'd Fantastic Four would beat the book, and I'd be like, oh my god, you know, in that particular issue, I might want to be the thing because he's gone toe to toe with the Hulk. And then I'll see like another episode where it's like, uh, then I pick up another issue of Spider Man. I'm like, oh my god, like Spider Man's having a really good day today. And then I I and I want to be Spider Man, but um, I, I think it it probably have to be. It, it it would have to be Fantastic Four. Spider-Man and Silver Surfer for me, um, just because of like the way how they were written was like, like you know like Jed says like they they were just written like like real people. I used to like lo- like the best parts of the Fantastic Four is them interacting with each other. It's like I I, I remember that you you'd see like the Human Torch and a thing having an argument, and they and they would fight. They were they were they were like like brothers, uh, but brothers with superpowers. So the thing would pick up like a couch, you know, like a like, and you try and hit the human torch, and the human torch would fly out the way, and then throw a little flame bomb, a little flame ball at him, and then like Reed would be like, "Stop, guys! I'm trying to, you know, I'm, you know." Then Sue would come in and be like, "Guys, stop! Reed's trying to do this thing next door. He's trying to make some, you know, doohickey that would take you into the negative, the, the negative zone." And then Reed's in the background with one arm going around there, and then his head coming around, going, "You know, please keep the noise down." And I love that. Yeah, because, yeah. like you said, you know, one of the things that I always say about about stories, whether it's a film, whether it's a book, a television show, whatever, if you can take the people from that or the story and play, and put it in another setting and it still works, then you're onto a winner. And and so and, and I always remember getting that from the Fantastic Four. I wanted to be a member of their family. Um, so so that's the reason why why I love those guys. Um, Spider Man, obviously, because you know I remember reading Spider Man like starting from back issues and he was a kid and then as it started going on obviously because i never read them canonically you know what i'd have some issues where he's a kid and i'd see some other issues where he's a teenager so yeah i always had that thing of like oh wow like this guy's gonna get older like i'm gonna get older as well and then i'm gonna be able to like you know have certain things like live by myself and all of this stuff and maybe get bitten by a radioactive spider and you know fall in love with a beautiful redhead i married a beautiful redhead but i don't have you know radioactive spider powers so I, I kind of got halfway there. And then with the Silver Surfer, there was just a way how he was just written in which he just seemed, he just seemed like this majestic, and it's only when I look back at it now, that this majestic, you know, Christ-like figure, which is what I see now. But then at the same time, he's just this overdramatic thespian. <laughs> like, like, you know, who just, you know, just des- wants to describe everything in such detail and he's able to do so many things. But all he wants to do is just observe and, you know, and, and just live his life. And mm. those, those, so those three comic books are the ones that just really, I used to read them and just get so engrossed and so immersed in them that I'd just be like, fuck, like any given moment, I could be any one of those characters just from reading a comic book. Um, but then in saying that, uh, Jed, um, Jed, Jason, you mentioned earlier on about, about um, Stan Lee being like a fan of like Errol Flynn and, you know, basically quite a lot, you know, getting that, having that whole thing where he wants to create characters from his inspiration from seeing Errol, Errol Flynn on film. Um, Fandral from the, the Warriors 3, who are basically Thor's best friends. Fandral is, is based on Errol Flynn. If you, if you look at the way how he's, how he's drawn and, and his whole attitude, and even interviews with Stan Lee, that's where he got the initial concept uh, for creating that character. So mm. I just thought I'd give a little bit of a, a little bit of insight into that. And as to how Stan Lee used things around him to create characters, because he did the same thing with like other characters, whether it be Tony Stark or, you know, um, or Reed Richards or, or whoever, you know. But, mm. but yeah, but those three comic books are the ones that really, really got me and still to this day get me. And I, and I think Fantastic Four is... Is a wasted opportunity at 20th Century Fox. Mm. Yeah, man. Um, I think for me, it would probably be Spider Man was was the character really that um, resonated with me um, because when I, you know, kind of stumbled across the the comic, as as you mentioned earlier, Richard, you know, he was a kid. Um, mm. He was a teenager, 
and he had to go through a lot of the things that all teenagers do go through um you know the difficulties at, at high school fitting into different peer groups um but on top of that had to juggle being a superhero and you know he often struggled to to juggle the the two sides of his life being a, a superhero and being you know a high school kid and, and a typical teen um and it was always that kind of side of, of Spider-Man that just really kind of spoke to me because it made me feel like, wow, like, you know, they they get what it's like to be a team. You know, these these writers, they get it. And and Stanley in particular, you know, they 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 get what the struggles are and they understand um how easy it is for us to feel kind of out of place. Um, you know, especially at that stage of, of our lives when we're trying to still work out, you know who we are and, and, uh, and the kind of person we're going to, to become in adulthood. So, um, you know, for me, that was was a big selling point with Spider-Man. And also, um, it was the genius of the costume, you know, um, in a sense that it always felt as if anybody could be Spider-Man. Um, you know, even though Peter Parker himself was was drawn as, you know, a white kid from from Queens, um once he had that mask on and the suit on he could be anybody um and i always felt like you know there's no reason why i couldn't be spider-man i mean yeah i'm a, a a black boy from south london i don't know nothing about that but you know there's no reason why i can't because it's just a guy in a mask and that was the genius of, of Spider-Man is that, you know, anybody can be Spider-Man. It doesn't, it didn't matter who you were or, or where you came from. You could, you could be this character and you could, you know, have the adventures that he has and lives the, the live the life that, that he lives. And that's one of the, you know, the kind of many in, enduring things that, that Stan Lee has done with um, these characters that he's created and with this, um, mythology he's always managed to make these things um relatable to everybody um and i know you know inclusion was was one of the big things about um stanley he wanted comic books to be enjoyed by everybody and he wanted everybody who read comic books to feel um represented and to feel like they were uh, you know they were a part of of this world that he was creating um, you know, somebody else pointed out, um, you know, I was having a discussion with someone on Twitter and, and someone actually pointed out that, you know, it was two Jewish guys from New York who created Black Panther, the, the, the king of a fictional African nation. Um, and when you think about it, it's like, yeah, yeah, they actually did do that, didn't they? Like, you know, it's 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 kind of crazy that they had that level of foresight. But um you know even when you look at the x-men you know they, they were created at a time of, of great um social unrest in america um you know you had the civil rights movement you had the women's rights movement you had the the burgeoning sort of um gay rights movement in in america in sort of the late 60s and, and early 70s um and you know the way that the x-men characters were created and and what they stood for you know this group that were trying to protect a society that that fears it and hates it um was you know just so just so resonant really for for the the work that they were doing um that and you know then when you dive into it and you know you have the different um opposing views of, of professor x and magneto which many people say are based on you know malcolm x and martin luther king um you know he was very clever at kind of building all of that into to his world um, and still making it relevant to uh, a wider audience and to the lives that people were living at, at that time. So, you know, the, the, the characters themselves, as I said, that he created are just, um, you know, timeless. And, and that's the thing. They, you know, they've endured the test of time and um, they've gone on to become, as said, like, you know, pop culture icons for us today. Um, we'll get on... A, to a little bit now about kind of um the the movies and, and things like that um so the next question to you guys is um you know stan lee is has become somewhat famous now for his cameos um that he would often make in in movies and, and tv shows um so what's your favorite stan lee cameo what's the one that that you really enjoy the most um jed i'll, I'll start with you on that one 
Yeah, does it does it have to be in in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Or could it be in general? No, no, just a just a Stanley cameo, just wherever he's appeared because he's yeah. been outside of the Marvel Universe yeah. as well. So, well, um, I mean, I really like his appearance, more recent one in in uh, Ant Man and the Wasp, where he's, but uh, no, it's actually it was um, uh, Guns Galaxy Two, where he's one of the Watchers, right, or one of the Watchers mm. helpers. I thought that was good, but the 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 main one I love is the one I mentioned earlier, the one. Alvin also mentioned his, his, his appearance in, in Morats because he actually gets to act properly in that. He actually gets a long, long scenes in it where he's, um, where Brody's like looking at a couple through a, through a shop window um, and just, just kind of reminiscing about him and his girlfriend that just broke up. And then Stanley rocks up and just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This reminds me of the time when Gwen Stacy and, and Peter Parker went lingerie shopping and the Green Goblin turned up. And then he pump, pumpkin bombed the place, and then Brody's like, "Hang on, hang on, are you Stan Lee?" And he just goes absolutely mental. And then, like, the first thing he asks is, "Is uh, is the thing's dick made of rock too?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. And then he does this like long, long speech, and I've got like a little cutout of the speech speech he does. But he's basically trying to convince Brody to get back with his girlfriend, and he's saying, and he's saying, um that he's gone through heartbreak as well and he says to get through it he created some special new superheroes these were characters that reflect my own heartbreak and my own regrets and then Brody's like how so and he says well you see Doctor Doom he wears body armour um, and to conceal his own mangled form and then Stanley's like that was me beneath the armour the Hulk a normal guy one minute a rage of emotions next just like me when I thought about what I'd given up um and then uh, Brody says, so you create each character as a way to deal with your one big regret. And he's like, yeah, the girl that got, got away. But do yourself a favor, Brody. Um, go after the girl, basically. And then he kind of ends it with saying, um, um, he'd get, I'd give it all up, all of it, for just one more day with her. And like, you just think, you don't really, you're not really used to Stan Lee being like a good actor, but like, his acting in this is absolutely superb and like really convincing. I'm surprised he hasn't actually been given like bigger parts. He's only got to say a line here or there in the Marvel thing. I'd love for him for him to actually play a, a, a role um, if he obviously didn't die. Um, I'd love for him to have been given a chance to play a, a bigger role in, or I don't know, like a superhero himself. That would be quite cool. But mm, yeah, mm. all right. Well, who knows? We might get that in the future, man, because they filmed like I think uh, seven cameos before he died. Yeah, but didn't um, James Gunn film them all? Wasn't didn't James Gunn film all of the the future? So I remember, like about a year ago, before the, all the drama, James Gunn was like, "Yeah, yeah, I filmed like six Stan Lee cameos, the future mm. film." But I wonder if they're still going to use those. Well, they have to now, really. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I would, I would like to think they would do the right thing in that yeah. instance and and use them anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Rich kid, how about you, man? I think Jed might have stole your thunder there, though. Sorry, man. If I did, <laughs> no, that's that right. Fuck her. <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. Um, you can say the same thing, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, 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 more rats as well. Like, is I think, I, I mean, more rats is one. There's, there's, a, there's a few films that have always made me, that have always contributed to my love of film and wanting to study film and wanting to try and make film. And Kevin Smith, well, more rats is one of them. I saw more rats before I saw Clerks. Um, yeah. Hey, man. And yeah, I, yeah, you, you too, you too, yeah. And yeah. and the thing about Kevin Smith is, I mean, even if you see in his interviews and stuff, like he's just heavily influenced by you know by comic books and and rap and stuff like that. And and the thing about Morats is that it's actually Morats is, is a, Morats is a love letter to Stan Lee mm-hmm. and and to Marvel Comics. Um, and I mean so much so that he actually when he when he made that film, he had a falling out with Alex Ross. Um, and basically, uh, and anybody who doesn't know, Alex Ross is like a, a really famous uh, art paintist, uh, art paintist, painting, <laughs> painter artist. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, for like Marvel Comics, DC Comics, Image, um, loads of things. He, he just if you just Google his name, you, you've definitely seen his work. Um, uh, yeah, and, and so the, and and basically, Alex Ross basically had a had a few things to say with saying um, to Kevin Smith about him not acknowledging that Jack Kirby was also a contributor to the, to the creation of Marvel comics. And so they didn't talk for a few years and stuff. Mm. Um, but in like Jed said, um, just that bit of, of, of Stan Lee being, just being, just being Stan Lee. And it's one of those things where he tells a story about, you know, about the girl that he, that, that, you know, that, that he left. 
And there's something in me that, I mean, I don't know if it's true or not, but <laughs> I always believe that he's always told the truth. Yeah. Like, Stanley looks like that guy. Stan Lee is like the comic book white man version of Morgan Freeman. Like, Morgan Freeman could come in and tell you some shit, and you'd be like, hey, it's Morgan Freeman. He's not going to lie to me. So <laughs> but, so when Stan Lee's telling that story to, like, you know, to, to Brody, I can imagine, like, behind the scenes before they filmed, you know, Kevin Smith goes up to him and goes, hey, listen, there's going to be this scene and I want you to say this. And Stan kind of goes, well, Kevin Smith, why do I just say this? Because this is what really happened. And Kevin yeah. Smith just goes like, you're the fucking goat. Go ahead, man. <laughs> and, and, and that scene is just perfect. But yeah. even in the way, I mean, that fit, I mean, if you just, yeah, that, that scene, it, it, he talks how he writes. And even when you watch more rats, the way how he writes, the way how Kevin Smith writes dialogue anyway, it's almost like it's it's an ode to like you know the way how Stan Lee writes comic books as well, but yeah that that's that's my favorite scene. Like I, I think just because you get to see Stan Lee doing something, and it's not like a cameo or a fleeting thing where you have to be like oh my god there he is over there or that's his face and just like a poster like you know in an episode of Daredevil, you get to see Stan Lee and just do his thing and it, it's yeah I, I just I love that scene. Mm. Cool. Alvin, you're up next, man. What's your favourite? Alvin's so taken with emotion, he's like... Mm. Yeah, yeah, Alvin's a bit sad. <laughs> Wag one, Al. Wag one. <laughs> he was going to do more reps as well. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, it looks like, unfortunately, the, the man geek is having a few technical problems with his line. So um, I'll fill in with, with mine in the meantime. Um, for me, I think it is probably, and it's weird because I really don't like this film, um, but it's probably Spider Man 3. Um, what I like about it is it's it's perfect simplicity and it just kind of, for me, encapsulated everything about Stan Lee and, and the type of man that he was, really. Um, I don't know if you guys remember it. It's um, just after kind of the, the opening sort of act of, of Spider-Man 3. Um, and, you know, Peter Parker's walking through Times Square and there's like sort of Spider-Man mania going on and um you know the he walks up to this big electronic screen and there's like a scrolling bar saying that spider-man is going to receive the key to the city and you know all of these kind of things and and peter parker sort of stops and and looks at it and he shot from behind and then um entering the frame and standing next to him um from the back is this old guy and then we we get a, a cut and then it's a front-on shot and you realize it's stan lee standing next to him um, and Stan mm. Lee's kind of reading this um, scroll going across the screen and Parker sort of turns to look at him and Stan Lee turns and looks at Peter Parker and he says, you know, I guess one person can make a difference. And mm. then he walks away. And mm. I was just like, that. that's just so, you know, perfect for, for Stan Lee because that one line in itself, you know, encapsulates not only, um, you know, Spider-Man and the type of character that he created in Spider-Man, um, but it encapsulates everything that, that we know about Stan Lee in, in his belief that, you know, if you had um, the talent and the desire to do, really do something, you could really go for, for it and, um, and and chase your dream, you know? Yeah. Um, That's so that Yeah, so it's just, it, it's so deep, the, the way that that scene plays out. So, yeah, that's probably my favourite, I think. That, that's the one that's that, that tops it for me. You know, that's, I do love the Morat scene as well, though. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people have used that Spider Man three clip uh, in the last couple of days uh, mm. uh, on social networks just to kind of encapsulate what what uh, Stanley kind of meant to them. Um, mm. but yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's so true. Like he like for him to to kind of he he like made a small ripple in in time of like just creating a couple of characters and it just expands into this entire universe that's kind of taken over the entire world that mm. everyone went to it and it's, it must have it's like enriched so many people's imaginations god knows what's going to come out in the next 50 years off the back of all of these superhero movies and cinemas just m making people's imaginations go wild making them want to read comics it can only, it's only a good thing and like mm. Like I said, I think I said it in, in, in the chat. Well, maybe we'll save it till the end, what, what I think his legacy will be. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we're definitely going to get onto the legacy, um, yeah. for sure. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, as I said, it's been a remarkable kind of journey for Stanley and, you know, he, he lived to the age of 95, first and foremost, which is a damn good innings, you know, wh yeah. whichever way you look at it, you know, um, if you live to the nineties, you've, you've done, you know, you've done really well in life. Um, and it's, it's so fascinating because reading, uh, you know, a little bit about him as well. Um, he's someone who, you know, has experienced, quite a lot of fallow periods and downtimes and, and periods where, you know, his career really wasn't going in, in the right direction and, you know, had difficulties kind of getting things off the ground. Um, you know, and it, it's worthwhile remembering that, you know, Spi uh, God, I keep calling him Spike Lee. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, listeners. I don't know why I'm doing that. Uh, Stan Lee. Um, you know, it's remarkable that he didn't really hit his kind of golden patch until he was 39 i think that's when he he first created the fantastic four funnily enough was was at the age of 39 yeah um and it shows you how you know if you have the the persistence to kind of follow your dreams and to keep going and to to keep pushing through um even when you hit adversity even when things become difficult that you know you can make it through that on the other side um, and have tremendous success with your career. Um, because I said, you know, to, to be 39 and to not really have that that kind of smash hit character until you, you reach that age for a writer is, um, you know, it, it, it kind of shows you, I guess, how the power of the written word is is more powerful than, than time itself and age itself, you know, whereas mm -hmm. in a lot of other careers, if you haven't done what you need to do by 39, then you can forget about it. But, um, you know, in, in the world that he created, um, you know, that's, that's truly, truly remarkable, really. Um, it, you know, it really, really is. Um, I don't know about you, Rich, but that gives us, that gives me hope for us. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Hands down, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Jed, you don't count because you've already got a successful career. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> but um, yeah, you know, it, it really does, as said, um, show just how you can you can do that, you know. So uh, yeah, that's yeah. wonderful. Really, really wonderful. But as said, Lee himself has, has lived a, a really colourful life. I mean, he served in the armed forces during the war. Um, you know, in the, the 50s, he wrote a, a, a variety of different stories as well. He wrote, um, this is something that you mentioned earlier, Richard, when you and I were talking today, that he wrote romance comics as well, mm, mm. Um, which seems kind of weird when you when you think about Stan Lee, you instantly think Marvel. But mm. um, yeah, you know, he, he tried his hand at romance. He, he did Westerns, comedies, science fiction, horror, suspense. He did all kinds of stuff, really. Um, you know, he did some work on syndicated radio as well um, with a, a newspaper strip um, that was read out as a radio comedy in the 50s. So, um, yeah, there's loads of things that, that he kind of did creatively. Um, but I think, obviously, you know, the thing that we, we kind of really know him for, is, is said, is his work with Marvel. Um, and Marvel, you know, as a as a brand, has has kind of become synonymous with Stanley and and him with with the brand. The two are, you know, um, inextricably linked. Um, I saw that there was a tweet from Kevin Feige um, on the day of his passing, who's the the president of Marvel Studios, um, and he said, you know, basically, I owe my career to to Stanley um, because of, of the work that he did because of the, the characters he created. Um, and there's just, you know, it was incredible to see the amount of, of, you know, comic book writers and artists who, who kind of cited Stan Lee as their influence and their reason for doing what they're doing. Um, and also, you know, but outside of that, like writers of, of fiction and things like that, like, you know, like R.L. Stein, um, who wrote the Goosebumps books, you know, talked about what he did. Um, you know, he had rappers talking about what he did. It was mm. um, incredible to, to see just how far reaching his, his characters were. I think we've got the big A, the man geek back. Um, Alvin, are you there? Yo, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. we can hear you. We lost yeah, you there. Right. <laughs> I was talking to you, man. And then, like, other people were saying shit, and I thought I was getting cut off. But then, like, mm. you weren't being rude. You just couldn't hear me. Um, yeah. well, I was going to say the same scene that you said, 
by the way. Um, but obviously, um, I was saying it, but then no one could hear me, so it's lost <laughs> in the void now. Um, I guess, I guess, if I have to select a, a different cameo, it would be uh, the best bit of Fantastic Four: Rise of the Silver Surfer, where he's going to Sue and Reed's wedding. Uh, that seems actually <laughs> pretty funny, and it's it, that was one of the kind of like. Uh, one of the first few where he spoke, I think the Spider Man 3 one came first, perhaps. Yeah, and then that was probably like the second one where he had like quite a few lines and that, and it was more of like a little scene rather than him just appearing in, I don't know, grabbing like a little girl while Rubble's falling off the building or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think that's the best bit of Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. <laughs> it's a good question because because I haven't, I haven't <laughs> seen that film in ages. Is he playing Stan Lee or is or is he playing Willie? Is he playing yeah, Willie Lumpkin? List or something like that. Is he what? I think he said his name at some point. And is, is, is it Willie? Because I remember, I remember seeing him in the because he's in the first one as well, right? Yeah, he's he is, the, yeah, yeah, because yeah, he's the postman. And mm. but I remember there's this there's a famous well not a famous character but there's like well I mean it just I mean what we've been talking about about Stanley just writing characters and just making them just making them amazing. But there's just the postman who who delivers posts to the Fantastic Four in the Baxter Building or Four Freedoms Plaza or whatever base they're using at any any given moment in time. If it's based in New York, it was always given. It was always delivered by the same mailman, and his name was Willie Lumpkin, and he <laughs> looked like a like a slightly plumper, older version of Stan Lee. And so I remember seeing Stan Lee playing this character, and, I, and obviously because it's the 20th Century Fox Fantastic Four movie, I didn't pay that much attention. But where you just brought him up, Alvin, I just want to know if you if you knew if it was if he was actually playing the character of Willie Lumpkin. But nice no, in Fantastic Four Two: Rise of the Silver Surfer, he actually says his yeah. name. Uh, oh, uh, Stan- I want him in on the on the guest list. So he says, "Ah, oh, Stan Lee, like that," and the guy's like, "Nah, nah, nah," and like pushes him out. Because he's yeah, con- I remember that. Confirmed, I remember that. confirmed that uh, all of his parts, because you know, there's that theory that he's one of the watchers. Everyone says yeah. that in all the films, but he confirmed in a, in a in an interview that he sees himself as an like an emissary for the watchers. Like he helps out the watchers. Like mm. they're watching from 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 space from the moon, and he's down on on Earth actually. Physically interacting and and getting information to bring back to the watchers. That's mm. that. So he, so that's why he can play all of these parts. That's how he sees his cameos. And if you think about it like that, it's it's incredible. Mm. Uh, I love it. I well, love it. well, well, well I t- I'll tell you. Th- I'll tell you this much. I'll tell you how how that works even more. And mm. once again, this boils down to the writing of Stan Lee and how much he's influenced. Because if you, even if you think about it, right, he's played cameos in other. What's it called in, in other what's it called in um other franchises that yeah. are part of other studios. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you guys have been reading Spider Verse and basically what Spider Verse did. What well, there's Spider Get Spider Get Spider Geddon is the the sequel to um Enter the Spider Verse, yeah. um, which came out a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And what they did is that they basically said that every single Spider Man character that you've ever seen, whether it's the Spider Man. Um, Japanese TV show, Spider-Man and his amazing friends, they all belong to a particular universe. And so it just goes back to that thing of like them saying, okay, well, Stan Lee has created this universe and on top of that universe, he's created other universes um, with what if. So even Stan Lee appearing in like the Sony versions of the Spider-Man film or the 20th Century Fox versions of Fantastic Four and then appearing in the MCU, it still works. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's not even one of those things where you can where somebody can turn on and be like, oh yeah, like the studios came up with a really good idea. No, he wrote that fucking idea in the sixties, and they just <laughs> took it and ran with it. And but, once again, that just shows you the influence of the type of writing that he that he's done or yeah. he, he or he's had. There's that what what if issue where it's what if the uh, the creators of uh, or, or the the staff at Marvel became the Fantastic Four. And like, <laughs> Mr. Fantastic. And like Kirby yeah. was like, I think their thing or something. It's, it's a really weird issue, but but yeah. It's weird if that's like part of the uh, kind of canon, the Stanley canon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so cool, man. It's so cool that they were able to to do that. Um, well, I guess we, we need to start getting into legacy now, really. Um I mean, there's been like so many awards that he's received throughout his career. Um, but one of the interesting things that I didn't actually know was um, some of his charity work that he does. He he actually had a, a, or has still, sorry, a foundation called the Stan Lee Foundation, um, which was set up in 2010, um, which was set up with a, 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 a 
primary goal of, of improving literacy, education and the arts um, for young people. Um, and the stated goals are that it um, includes support programs and ideas that improve access to literacy, literacy and resources, as well as promoting diverse, diversity, national literacy, culture and the arts. Um, so the, the foundation being set up is, is a very cool thing and, and hopefully that continues on um, as part of his legacy. Um, he also made donations of his personal effects to the University at Wyoming um, at various times as well, which uh, is a really touching thing to do. And again, it gives a, a place where people can go and, and see some of um, you know the things that, that he had and, and the things that he used to create his, his art. But um, yeah, said so that brings us nicely on to, to kind of discussing his legacy, really. I mean, we're uh, for those of you who listen to the podcast regularly, you know, we're big fans of the MCU. And it kind of goes without saying that really there, there is no MCU without Stanley. Um, you know, historically, Stanley has been trying to or was trying to, to get Marvel characters on, on TV and film since, you know, way back in, in the early 70s. Um, and he hit, you know, a lot of brick walls with with Hollywood at the time. There wasn't really much um, interest from Hollywood studios and, you know, major producers and, and things like that um, in terms of getting these things off of the ground. So as said, you know, the, throughout Stanley's life, he's had very um, difficult periods professionally where he's had to kind of deal with um, people knocking him back. Um, but, you know, we're now at a point in pop culture history where as said Marvel is um, you know synonymous with with pop culture where you know people own Marvel clothing they own Marvel collectibles Marvel is a part of video games comics you know it's it's everywhere the brand is everywhere um, and his face is is so familiar to, to people around the world because of um, his d desire and, and his passion for his work so um, you know, the, the, the big question for you all, I guess, is, as I said, is, is for you, you know, what is, I guess, the enduring legacy of Stanley? And, you know, there's there's not one thing necessarily, really. I see, you know, multiple things. So it'd be interesting to get uh, you guys' thoughts on that and, and what you think that is. Um, Jed, I know you're chomping at the bit, so um, you can go first. Uh, well, like, just, uh, I think I mentioned uh, one thing um, on chat, like the day that that, um, so his kind of enduring legacy will be that um, in like 100 years, in 150 years, in 1,000 years, when, when we think about like historically what our legends are and what the stories that we pass down to our kids, like the kind of like the Norse mythology where they, where they talk about the, the old gods and stuff, to, to, to people in the future, the old gods will literally be Thor, will literally be Doctor Doom will be the Fantastic Four. They'll be spoken about like they they were like real characters because they'll be so ingrained in the culture in the future. Because the pop whatever's in the, in the pop culture now is is what future civilizations will base their like religions on and base their society on. Um, there will be people in the future. There'll be like a real like there'll be real versions of things that are in the comics that we take for granted now. There'll be like. It, it, it could be vehicles, it could be uh, buildings, um, based on all the, all of the films that spawned off from um, uh, from his imagination. These films will never stop. The Marvel films will never, never, ever, ever, ever stop. And we're living in a world now where we're so deep into the MCU, we can, almost can't remember a time when there wasn't an MCU, and and we almost take it for granted that in six months' time, another like amazing, like well-written, massive blockbuster of these crazy characters that you grew up with will come out and it'll be good. And, and we live in a world also now where we are the, we are the majority, like we were the minority, but we are the majority you now. And one man, like, like you said in that quote, like one person can make a difference. He has made the minority the majority, but we're no longer like keeping ourselves secret um, that we're in comics and the geeky things. We can, we are happy to say it out loud, we, we wear it on, on, on badges, we wear it on our t-shirts, we wear it on our jackets, we have backpacks saying how much we love the stuff that we love. And like we're not scared anymore to say, I oh, you know what, Spider-Man's cool, here's my tattoo. Like, I'm wearing like Wonder Woman stuff. It's just shit like that. We'll never be scared again because of one man and, and what he initially did. Um, yeah, for all time now. 
Mm. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, it, it's it's immeasurable how you know how massive the the impact has has been on on every facet of society um, that that his work has had. And as as I was saying earlier, Alvin, um, you know, he he has influenced you know rappers and um, you know artists, not just comic book artists, but regular artists and you know novel writers. He's influenced journalists. He's you know, influenced people who have gone on to do all various different things within their their own lives. Um, you know, and he's infused people that haven't always felt confident about who they are and, and the things that they like. And he's infused them with that confidence and with that belief um, that, you know, what they like is is good and valid and, and has a part to play in, you know, helping everyone else around the world. And, and that's a, a glorious thing. Um, so yeah, indeed, that is you know a, a true testament to to yeah. what he is and what he can do. I just watch because you guys must remember the time when you go into a comic shop. You almost look like look left and right before you go in in case anyone sees you. You go in, you buy your comics, you stick it in your bag, you zip up your bag to make sure none of it's sticking out. You get on the bus or whatever. You're not going to read that comic on the on the bus. Not not in. Oh like, hell no! <laughs> that, 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 that's you. That's you guys. That's you guys. That was never oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, had to, I had to man and yeah. then when you get home the first thing is you rip open your bag no i'm not i'm not hungry i'm not fine run into mm. your room you get that comic out you put it on the floor you will read it back to the front and those were the days when like you used to read a comic for like 10 times over and then the next day you would know almost know it off by heart and you would like share it share it with your friends oh you haven't read that comic I'm like what well, you're so behind and it only came out like the day before <laughs> um, but like but like now like psh- like people show off with their comics on the trains. They're like, you can see what they're reading. Everyone's got the what, like what reading Watchmen, and you just think, where were you twenty years ago? And like when I needed you, now you can mm. now you're reading on, the, <laughs> on the DLR. Mm. Uh, but yeah, sorry, go. On. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That's very true, man. That's very true. Um, yeah, uh, Alvin, how about you, man? Uh, what were you? What will his legacy be? Did you say? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what do you think will be part of his enduring legacy? You know what? There's just so much to unpack that. Mm. That's like a massive question to me. Um, I mean, for people who want to tell stories, it, it's just kind of like the simplicity of the characters, but then they're also complex as well. Mm. Like it's not. It's not like you see something like Spider-Man, you think that's very simple, but there's actually a lot fucking going on there. You know what I mean? You see Daredevil, you think that's something quite simple, but there's something else going on there, but everything he does is I don't I don't think anything's the same that he's ever done anything the same. Some people could see that and they see the surface level stuff and think it's all the same, but everything's all different and everything's there for a reason. And I just think it in terms of like storytelling and character, um, people will be pretty envious because I don't think anyone can do it. I think there's people who do it as good as he does it, but there's no one who does it like he does it. And I think Marvel actually find it difficult to kind of emulate him and some of their other like early creators uh, for today. So that's why I, I don't think their their stuff is as good as some of the classic stuff. But I, I think they should really kind of go back to basics and, and take a look at what well, people like Stan and whatnot. Um, but but yeah, in terms of storytelling, he just leaves like a wicked body of work behind that I think people will continue to to adapt into uh, into films and stuff like that and TV shows. Uh, maybe some of his later stuff, uh, perhaps not like, I don't know if you remember the animation projects that he did uh, on DVD. Was it around like around 2006, I think there was one called Condor and it was some kid with a skateboard and wings or some weird mm. shit like that. Mm, and he I did remember a- that. Show called the reflected which i think was on crunchyroll which it was a decent idea it wasn't ex- executed the best but i think everyone will always uh always kind of like connect more with with kind of like his marvel stuff and whatnot and and yeah i think any, anyone who's gonna like want to be a comic artist or uh even well more specific a comic writer um is gonna uh is gonna definitely want to kind of like check out his stuff and have a look at writing in the Marvel method and stuff like that. 
Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, but but yeah, he's just he's just too fucking good in it. <laughs> um, rich kid, uh, what about you, man? What do you think his legacy will will be? Well, the the thing is, for like for me, it's like his legacy was already here before he even passed away. That's the thing. I mean, you guys have touched upon like you know the the TV and the film and stuff, but any any comic book that you read now, like I mean, like okay, so let's say, let's just I mean let's not talk about other comic brands or like brands, but if you just look at Marvel, if you look at some of the some of the some of the best writers that they've got or that they've had, some of uh, have left and come back at some point. So you look at Brian Michael Bendis, Bendis like writing Ultimate Spider Man and and creating that Ultimate Universe. Bendis basically just redid what's it called? He just redid um Stanley anyway. Like it like to me it's the equivalent of Eddie Murphy doing Raw and Delirious. And mm-hmm. that's just a that's just a straight up homage to like Richard Pryor's Live mm-hmm. on a Sunset Strip and um and the other one. So so you look at that and then you, or you look at like Jonathan Hickman writing Fantastic Four and he's basing his Fantastic Four on John Byrne. John Byrne's run on, on Fantastic Four during the 80s into the 90s, uh-huh. who John Byrne basically based his Fantastic Four on Stan Lee. So even while he was still alive, his legacy is still being felt throughout the, throughout the comic book universe. So I'm interested to see how that's going to, how, you know, how his legacy is going to keep on affecting people through other people to these new ones coming on, onto the scene. That's what I'm really, that's what I'm really interested in seeing because like, you know, he's, he's started something different. And, you know, we mentioned the whole thing where, like, you know, the, the, the stuff he did in 2006, you know, and it wasn't that great. And but it was Stan Lee. So you're like, OK, cool. Well, he, you know, you, you gave it a good try. But he's essentially set the foundations for how comic books can be read to a certain degree. The same way how you might look at, you know, how you look at Batman and you look at Superman and they have that, you know, they, they have those those stopes that you, that you can tick a box off. OK, he can fly. Okay, tick. Oh, he's got a cape. He can tick. Like Stan Lee has written characters where, or written stories where people are just like, shit. You look at like the Fantastic Four, um, the coming of Galactus that Jed mentioned earlier on, issues 48, 49, and 50. He was doing summer blockbusters or winter blockbusters in three issues. Mm -hmm. So you can, you understand? So so you can see the legacy that he's had, that, that, that he's had already and before he even passed away. So I'm just really interested to see if his death is going to kickstart people into vain, okay, well, listen, now I really want to, I really want to fulfill my potential. You know, that whole thing, like you said, you know, he says, you know, one, it looks like one man can make a difference. Now this now is, he might be, you know, his legacy might be that thing of that. People will be like, I used to want to want to write a comic book, but in the day Stan Lee passed away. Now I just really want to fucking write a comic book. I really want to do it. And just like, just do me and make a difference for myself. And if anybody else is along for the ride, let's go for it. Because he's been doing it for years anyway. So I like I mean, so I mean in regards to his legacy, his legacy was here before he even left any, either way. So I I'm just excited to see what comes next. Okay. Um yeah, I mean I'm kind of with all of you guys, I, I guess in a way. Um his legacy for me or part of it, I mean, because as you said, it's it's you know, when you're talking about somebody who was so influential on, on pop culture, you can't really narrow it down to, to one thing. But I think for me on a personal level, it's his embrace of imagination and, and creativity um, and his encouragement of other people as well. Um, you know, it, it it goes kind of without saying, listeners, really, that, I, you know, I'm not even sure that Wulong Talks would be here if it wasn't for, you know, the effect that Stan Lee had on us um, growing up as, as, as kids and enjoying, you know, his work and, and also enjoying what he represented. And also, you know, his advocacy for his, his art form, you know, he loved comic books, absolutely adored them. Um, And not just because he enjoyed, you know, writing them or he enjoyed the fruits of his labor, but also because he enjoyed the impact that they had on other people um, and the way in which they would uh, inspire the imaginations of of his readers and and that and the way that they would then go on to um, influence them in other things, as, as Richard said. So, yeah, I think you know he, his legacy is definitely that, you know, that that inspiration that he's given i guess is is the word i'm looking for you know 
um, that inspiration is is really to me um, the the most important thing that that he could have given us all really. Um, so yeah, yeah, th that's it for me really. <laughs> I know that's a bit of a <laughs> of an anticlimactic answer to, to end this week with, but yeah, I think that's kind of what's what's going to do it for me. Um, but before we wrap it all up, listeners, I think it's it's best that we hear from the man himself. Um, I don't know if you guys have any favorite quotes of his that you wanted to share, but I've, I found one that I think is particularly apt. But yeah, I've, um, got, I've got I've got one. Yeah, go for it. Um, just one that kind of I think it kind of uh, fits like all of us guys because he said once um, uh, I think it was in an interview uh, a couple of years back that he uh, he said I used to be embarrassed because I was just a comic book writer while other people were building bridges or going on to medical medical careers and then I began to realise entertainment is one of the most important things in people's lives without it it might go off the deep end I feel that if you're able to entertain people doing a good thing and i think um now in these dark times entertainment is one of the most important things that we have mm. for sure well i mean entertainment is is how we're all getting through these dark days right now yeah. believe me so yeah without that um yeah i don't know where we'd be at <laughs> um rich or alf did you have a favorite quote or you call cool with me just going with this one um, okay. okay, yeah, go ahead, Alvin. I'm just gonna go with uh, Excelsior. <laughs> yes, of course, why not? Um, yeah, and Rich, go ahead, man. True believers, that's it, straight yeah. up and down. True believers, like, I, I think that just says, I mean, everything, everything he seems to write, just nothing seems to be just written just for, just, just for the hell of it, you know, like you said, like. Jed, when he that little interview that he that he said, or Alvin, he's saying Excelsior and Jason. I don't know what you're gonna say next, but I'm sure it's gonna be something freaking amazing. But just that whole thing of true believers, like you hear that, and it's just that is that welcome for anybody that is a reader of something that he's helped create, and is that is that inclusion, and that and that's it's just one of those things that I think that's one of the and it once again boils down to his writing and his is that style of writing that has made us, like you said, you know, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here. Is, is that little thing, that little affirmation of like, listen, okay, welcome to this place. You, you, can, you can read this, you can participate in this. And, and I just love that. It's like, it's, it's his welcome to everybody that's out there, whether you've, you've, you've been reading, reading comics for years or watching comic books or whether you're, you're just, you know, you're just coming onto the thing. You hear that saying and you're just like, Wow, that's just nice and just really, you know, really friendly, and that's that's one of the things that I, that I love. I love when you guys to hear that. I, you'd see it in the comic books, um, you'd see it, and you know, at the beginning of cartoons, let's say when he used to do the narration, and you're just like, that's that's Stan Lee. Like if Stan Lee opened up something without saying, "Hey, true believers," you're right. like, yeah, someone's doing an impression of him. It's not really Stan Lee. Like, get off my screen or don't <laughs> stop writing, you know. So yeah, so true, I'm gonna go with true believers. Cool. Well, I've got a, a quote here, which um, I think kind of sums him up nicely as well. Um, so this is taken from an interview he did with IGN.com. Um, and he says, I don't know where the hell I'll be in five years. Maybe I'll be producing movies. Maybe I'll be on a street corner selling apples. I don't know, but I'm having a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> and I think that just kind of sums up exactly the kind of man who that Stanley was. So... Stan Lee, we salute you. Thank you for giving us years and years of entertainment and education and joy. Um, you know, you've influenced, as said, millions of people across the globe and, and many, many artists to go on and, and do the things that they do. Um, you know, you were a true giant of, of the pop culture universe and your enduring legacy will live on and on and on and on for as long as, as people are telling stories. Um, so yeah, we salute you, ma'am. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed listening to the podcast and, you know, if you're feeling a bit emotional, then feel free to let some of that emotion out, man. This, that's not a bad thing. Um, first up, I want to say thank you to Jed and to Big A for joining us. Um, Jed, do you want to give a quick plug for Salt while you're here? 
Yeah, go go watch Soul. It's you can find it on Vimeo. Type in Soul or something, or go to my Twitter at Jed Shepherd, J E D S H E P H E R D, uh, and check it out because I'm always tweeting about it. I'm just spamming everyone about it. But um, yeah, then you can see Soul. But you can also check out Dawn of the Death and Absence and my other ones, other films if you want. And uh, yeah, hope you like it and Excelsior. <laughs> And Big A, uh, how about you, bro? Um, where you at and where can people find you and what you're working on at the moment? Uh, if you want to get me on Twitter and Instagram, uh, I forgot my handle. Wait, at Big A. Wait, <laughs> I've said it in so long. You can find me anyway. Like, close your <laughs> eyes, make a wish. You'll fucking find me. Or, I don't mm-hmm. know, link up with the Wulong boys and then fucking you can get me. So I don't know why I'm swearing <laughs> so much. And then you can get me through them. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Well, thanks a lot. I said, listeners, um, we also want to say a, a quick thank you to our friend Rob Wade from Emotionally 14. Um, we're part of the Emotionally 14 network called E14 Endorsed. Um, what does that mean? Well, you'll find out in the show notes on the app that you're listening to this too. So just make sure you head down there and check that out. Um, also, regarding Jed's film Salt, as he said, it's available free for you to watch right now on Vimeo. Uh, we actually have it up on our website. So if you visit our website, www.wulongtalks.com, um, you'll see a post up on there about um, the movie that Joe, Jed has written and you'll find a link to actually watch it through Vimeo as well. So make sure you go and do that so our friend can get paid the big bucks so we can ride his coattails to Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> and we also want to say a big thank you to the Britpod scene, um, which is a, a network of British independent podcasters who continues to support everything we do here at Wulong Talks. If you want to find out more about the Britpod scene, then again, just head to the show notes here on the app that you're using and you'll find a link to the website there. Um, and before we go as well, I just want to mention, of course, that the Bebop Rewatch podcast is still going strong. We haven't done an episode in a little while, but we will be recording one this weekend. Um, we'll be up to session eight. Um, but if you want to check out session seven, the previous one, which coincidentally features our guest, Jed Shepard, you could go ahead and check that out on any podcast app uh, where you find Wulong Talks. And we'll be right there. Okay, well, uh, that's going to do it from us. As said, thank you for listening. Um, we really appreciate you guys. Um, you guys are awesome. And, um, you know, if there's anybody in your life that you appreciate, make sure you let them know that you appreciate them as well. Um, don't wait until it's too late because, you know, death has a way of, of creeping up on us when we least expect it. Perhaps not in Stan Lee's case, but, <laughs> you know, certainly it can happen. Um, so if there's something you want to say to somebody, get it off your chest, man, and say it. Um, and as Stan would say, you know, go out and have fun and live your life. All right, we're out here, everybody. Um, say goodnight, Rich. Good night, Rich. Let's say good night, Big A. <laughs> good night. And say good night, Jed. Good night, Jed. <laughs> that the, is, hold on, is it the wait, 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 wait. This is like just at Walton's. Is the yes, it, is. Up as well. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and I'm Paul Walton. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to us. If you're down with Wulong Talks, show some love by following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Wulong Talks. You can also find us online at www.wulongtalks.com or drop us an email at wulongtalkspodcast at gmail.com. We can also be found as part of the Britpod Scene Collective and we're also officially E14 endorsed. Search for those hashtags to enjoy more content from us and from other great British podcasters. 